Before we turn to the word of God, would you join me briefly as we talk again to the God of the word. Our Father in heaven, thank you that we can come to you today in Jesus' name and know that you hear us. Thank you for your presence, your faithfulness, your mercy, and your marvelous grace. Now as we turn our attention to your holy word, please open our eyes and ears that we may hear your voice. For I ask this in the wonderful name of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, I want to ask you to put on your thinking cap for a moment and begin with this question. How important are good works in the life of a Christian? How important are good works in the life of a Christian? I think that's especially appropriate now as our culture becomes more and more secular, I guess is the right word. Some might say more pagan, but more secular, very much like the first century was. Let me illustrate how this affects us. Joe and Tom were good buddies, and through the invitation of a friend, they both began to attend a good Bible-believing church. Before long, they both responded to the gospel. They put their faith in Christ, and they trusted him to save them from their sin. And they both rejoiced in their new faith. They enjoyed attending church, and they went to Sunday school. They went to midweek Bible study and prayer meeting, and, and they were both making new friends, and it appeared they both might have the making of church leadership one day. By the time a year had passed, though, there was a big difference between Joe and Tom. Oh, they were still friends like they used to be. Both of them had been baptized, joined the church, still attended regularly. But, but Tom had dropped out of the midweek Bible study and, and the prayer meeting, and he complained that he was just too busy. He was just too busy. Joe and Tom's old unsaved friends began to notice a difference, too. It didn't take them long to see that, that Joe was just out of it. But Tom... Tom was still good for a laugh, telling or listening to off-color jokes, going to an R-rated movie with them, hanging out with the old crowd like he used to. Tom saw nothing wrong with that. As he put it, he said, I'm still enjoying life. I'm still enjoying life. Both Joe and Tom thought of themselves as, as good Christians. But when Joe had coffee with Tom one day and shared his concern about Tom's testimony, Tom got upset and he said, hey, I'm just as much of a Christian as you are. We all have to live our lives the way we see best. Being a Christian shouldn't mean that I can't enjoy life the way I always did. And what's the big deal about my lifestyle anyway? And Joe wasn't sure what to say to his friend. What would you have said? Think about that. You know, I've always thought that what you believe affects the way you live. And uh, Rick Warren, who some of you know, wrote that book on the purpose-driven life. He said this. He said, you only believe as much of the Bible as you actually do. I like that because it's so simple. You only believe as much of the Bible as you actually do. Whether we want to admit it or not, the world's mindset has gradually invaded the church. What do you think about the lifestyle of Christians today? What about your lifestyle, my lifestyle? In the midst of a rapidly changing value system, have you and I become part of this world system or has it subtly become part of the church? Today we're going to begin a series on Paul's letter to Titus in the New Testament. It can help us in understanding what the lifestyle of a Christian ought to be who lives in a pagan or a secular society. And what Paul wrote by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit applies to all ages, all situations, and all relationships in life. And I invite you to turn there in your Bible in the New Testament to the book of Titus. Now first of all, let me give you some background some context for this letter. The author, we know, was the Apostle Paul, because he begins out saying so. It was uh, written by him about A.D. 63 to 66. That was approximately 30 years after Jesus' crucifixion. Now, to give you an idea, that's, for us, about the same amount of time since George H.W. Bush was president and we began Operation Desert Storm in Iraq. You remember that? That was about 30 years ago. That's about the same amount of time that Paul's writing after the crucifixion of Christ. Now, the recipient was Titus. If you read the book of Acts, you'll find no mention of Titus in the book of Acts. We learn of him only through some brief references in some of Paul's other letters. And what we do see of him is very impressive. He was a Greek Gentile. What's a Gentile? A non-Jew. He was not a Jew. He was Greek. And uh, uh, it seems uh, from the beginning of the book that he came to Christ under Paul's ministry. 
Paul calls him his true son in our common faith. And he tended to refer to people like that who he led to the Lord. He was Paul's personal representative to deal with some of the problems in the Corinthian church. And Paul's selection of him to uh, establish churches on Crete is a tribute to his persistence, his courage, and his strength as a young man. And and chapter 2 seems to establish the fact that he was still a young man. Now, where was Crete? Well, if you're familiar with that part of the world, the Mediterranean Ocean, uh, Crete is just kind of south and a little bit east of of the Greek peninsula and a little bit south and west of what present-day Turkey would be. And Titus was working on this island. It's the largest island in the Mediterranean Sea. It's about 160 miles long. Give you an idea, that's about how far it is from Washington, D.C. to Trenton, New Jersey. Okay, it's about that distance. That's the length of the island. And it varies from 7 to 30 miles wide. And Paul had apparently been there with him because he writes in verse 5 of chapter 1, he says, I left you in Crete. So he had been there. He had been there doing some work with the churches there. Now, the inhabitants of Crete, Very interesting culture. Uh, That used to be called a Minoan society, if you're a student of history. Uh, And uh, they had an evil reputation by the time Paul was writing. In ancient times, they had attained a glorious civilization. Uh, It was advanced, but by the time of the first century, the civilization had fallen and declined. The inhabitants were crude. They were barbaric. They were regarded by the rest of the Roman Empire with aversion and contempt. Their falsehood was proverbial. The expression to cretize meant the same thing as to lie. It was a synonym for lying. And to play the Cretan with a Cretan meant to out-trick a trickster, out-con a con man. Isn't that interesting? Their morals, to say the least, were low. And you know that sounds a little bit like where we are today in America compared to the one we grew up in, wouldn't you say? Now, the churches on Crete seemed to have been loosely organized and were plagued with many false teachers. Some of them were Jewish. How the churches began were not told, but they had evidently been in existence for some time, maybe even established by Jews who were present on the day of Pentecost, because the book of Acts does mention that Cretan Jews were present. And you see from this verse here that that there were rebellious people, talkers, deceivers. Uh, The circumcision group would have been Jewish people. And they were causing problems in the churches. And so Titus's job on Crete was to appoint godly leaders for the churches and to teach the Christians correct sound doctrine. That's why Paul left them there. So as we take a brief look at this letter today, we're going to see that the truth of the gospel sets three standards for the lifestyle of the church, which Titus was to teach them. And we're going to kind of just take... Uh, 30,000 feet view of Titus as we fly over it. Okay, then we'll get into it more detail in the weeks ahead. All right, the first standard for the lifestyle of the church that, that Titus was to teach them is that church leaders must be examples of what is good. What is good, okay? What is God's standard? That's what Paul wanted to zero in on. God's standard is, is a church leader must be one who loves what is good. Loves what is good. The King James says here, good men. Uh, the Greek just says, lover of good. You have to supply what we are talking about here. Uh, the New King James says, lover of what is good. Obviously, this love will show in a person's life. If you love what is good, right? It's going to show. The rest of the chapter, which we'll get into later, we'll talk about the what they were to do and the why they were to do it. Okay? He contrasts church leaders with the false teachers that were present in the church that I mentioned just a few minutes ago. They are to do what is good. And everything is set them an example by doing what is good. So Titus was a church leader, and he was to show the other church leaders they were to do what was good. A church spiritual leader must set an example and teach what is good because that was one of God's purposes in saving us. Later in the, ch- in the, in the book, Paul says that uh, there are supposed to be people that are eager to do what is good. Not just, do what's good, grudgingly, but eager to do it. Eager to do it. You remember he wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesians 2.10, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Why? To do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. It's not just what we think is good, but we need to know what God prepared for us to do. Leaders must show the way. But what's the standard for our lives, for your life, for my life? Do you love what is good? 
Do you? Especially this is important in leadership positions. And men, you and I are training to be leaders. Paul's instructions to Titus have special importance for us because we're called to be spiritual leaders in our homes as well as in the church. We're not beyond temptation just because we attend church regularly or if you were elected to a church office. That doesn't mean you're beyond temptation. Or even if you go to seminary to prepare for ministry. I can remember when I was in seminary at Grace Theological Seminary, I learned of a seminary student who'd allowed himself to be drawn into sin while he was attending school. He had worked for a large local company, and he got involved in an affair with a married co-worker. They were discovered, and he was forced to resign. But what did that do to the testimony of Christ in the community at that business? Not to mention at Grace Theological Seminary and Grace Schools. What did it do to the testimony of Christ? Folks, a godly life is important. Not just for leaders, but for all of us, but especially for leaders. Unfortunately, that young man was arrogant in his sin. He didn't repent. Can you imagine, would you like to have him to be your Sunday school teacher or your pastor? That's why it's important that we love what is good. Not only must church leaders love and do what is good, But this standard is for the rest of the church as well. The second standard for the lifestyle of the church is that church members' lives must also be good. This is what Titus was to teach, and this is true for us today as well. What is God's standard? We see that in chapter 2, verse 7, where he was to teach them that they are to be doing what is good. Not just the leaders, but also the church members. Paul says, Titus, you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine, and good works are the natural companion to truth. Truth changes our lives. Good works are specific, too. He tells each group in the rest of chapter 2 what they should be doing. Not just general good deed doing, but God has planned in advance, as we saw in Ephesians. He has planned in advance what we should do. Let me give you an example. In chapter 2, verse 6, he says to likewise encourage, urge the younger men to be what? Self-controlled. Isn't that interesting? Now, the King James has sober-minded. It means sound-minded. It means self-controlled. This is what sets Christians apart in a secular culture in a pagan world. And folks, we live in a day where people do whatever they want. I've told you before, the philosophy of this age is, if it's not, it's not illegal if you don't get caught. The latest thing among the young crowd in high school, they have TikTok videos that they're trying to imitate now, that where kids have been stealing sinks out of bathrooms and posting videos of themselves online. That's, a, that's against the law, okay? But if you don't get caught, it's fun, you know? Self-control is what sets Christian apart. Christians apart. In other words... Think first. I love this. Stop, think, and then act. Will this please God? Is this good? Is this what I should be doing? And folks, let's be honest. For the Christian, this is a spiritual battle because we have an enemy who wants to defeat us at every turn. And if he can ruin your testimony in your neighborhood, in your community, think of how many people won't become a Christian because of Christians who fall. Well, what is the motivation? What's your motivation for doing good works? You ever think about that? Now, for a lot of people, growing up in some churches, fear was the motivation. You know, if you don't do good, God's up there looking over the balcony of heaven, and you cut that out or I'm going to get you. You know, it's fear of punishment. Okay? Is that a good motivation? No. And that's not the motivation that Paul tells is the motivation for the Christian. The motivation for the Christian is grace. Look at this, Titus 2, he says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It, what, the grace of God, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. I've talked about this before. When you, when you receive God's grace, you're overwhelmed with gratitude. Your sins are forgiven. You didn't do anything for that. God gave that to you. And that sense of gratitude makes us want to serve God. It is duty. It's not duty. It's beauty to serve Him. I always like to stop and define terms. What is grace? I like this very simple definition of grace. It's getting what we don't deserve. We don't deserve to be forgiven. We don't deserve eternal life in heaven. 
We got what we don't deserve because Jesus paid for it, didn't he? Here's another good one. I like this. It's an acrostic. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Maybe you've heard that before. It's a good way to remember grace. Jesus paid it all, didn't he? We don't contribute anything to receive what we have gotten from God. It is all grace. Titus 2, verses 11 to 12, I would say, is the passage in the New Testament on grace and its effect in our lives. And what is the purpose of Christ in doing this? He says in chapter 2, verse 14, Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own. The King James is, you remember here's where it says a peculiar people. You remember that? It means a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. That's why he gave himself for us. So what is the standard for our lives, for your life? Most of us probably don't have a problem understanding that good works go along with the gospel and that they are specific, but how about your motivation, your motivation for the good works that you do? Do they spring from an attitude of gratitude for God's grace in your life? I hope so. Could it be said about you? That you are eager to do what is good. When people describe you that way, you are eager to do what is good. Now, if you're like me, you may struggle with this. You know, I work two jobs, okay? I don't have a lot of extra time. I'm, I'm just really busy all the time. And you know when I'm driving down the road and you see a hitchhiker, I'm awful suspicious now. Used to be you were safe, but I don't know about picking up hitchhikers, even though there'd be an opportunity to talk to them about the Lord. You know what I'm saying here? I struggle with this. Even pastors, okay, struggle with this. I remember years ago, Marion, you might remember this, when I pastored in Michigan, there was a young couple that was passing through, stopped at our church. They had an old beat-up car. They were disheveled. They had a baby. They had no relatives in the area. They didn't have any food. They didn't have any supplies. And I wasn't sure what to do. It tested my motivation because they wouldn't be able to be coming back next Sunday. (laughs) Okay. They needed help right then and there. They were just passing through. What do you do? Well, I talked to Marion and and we invited them to dinner. We we got some diapers for them. We said goodbye. I don't have any idea what happened to them. We did it in Jesus' name. Okay. But you struggle with motivation. You do. We all do because we're human. But there is a benefit to a life of doing good. It draws others to Christ. In my first church, uh, I led a milkman to the Lord and his friend, Paul and Mario. Okay, they were big guys. They had to unload milk cartons and all that kind of stuff. And they were so excited. They sat right in the front row every Sunday in church. They were just so excited to be there. And then one day, I got a letter addressed to the church. And it was from a person I didn't know. And I opened it up. And there was a guy who was stuck on the Trenton Bridge going over the Delaware River with a flat tire. And Paul and Mario were driving over, and they stopped. They jumped out of their car. They were all happy. They said, can we help you? What can we do? And they changed the guy's tire for him. And, you know, there's hundreds of people passing by during rush hour. Nobody stopped. These guys stopped. And the man said to them, why did you stop and help me? And they told him. They said it was because of Jesus. Because they'd come to Christ and they, they wanted to help people. And he goes, what church do you go to? <laughs> and he wrote us a letter telling us about it, thanking us. I think he even put a donation for the church in. I have no idea what happened to him, but there was a great witness that day. Because those young men were eager to do what is good and help. Yes, it delayed them from going where they were going. But they made a difference in a man's life for eternity. Isn't that something? So, church leaders must be examples of what is good. Church members are to be eager to do good work. But but Paul's concern doesn't end there. In a society that is permeated with situational ethics, the church must not be known for occasionally doing good works only when it's convenient. The third standard for the life of the church is that the whole church, everyone in the church, must be devoted to doing good. What is good? The whole church. That's God's standard. After, after teaching and reviewing his, his doctrine of salvation, Paul points out that sound doctrine produces good works. 
He says, remind the people to be ready to do whatever is good. Why do they need that reminder? Because they weren't doing it, okay? Remind them to be ready to do whatever is good. Stressing truth is profitable, and it results in devotion. Look what he says in chapter 3, verse 8. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things, so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent, and they are profitable for everyone. They're profitable for everyone. Now, when he says to devote themselves to doing what is good, the word means to busy yourself with, to be engaged in doing what is good. Christian faith is intended to change human lives. It's not just, well, we believe something different than they do. Now, remember, back in that society, Greeks and Romans believed in a whole pantheon of gods, and they worshipped the emperor. Did you know that Christians were accused of being atheists because they didn't worship all those gods and the emperor? And so there were church fathers who rose up uh, to defend them. And one of the early uh, defenders of Christianity was Athenagoras of Athens. Okay? And he defended Christianity saying it was the only religion that really made people's lives better, that they were Christians were more pious because they worshipped this one God. Jesus Christ. Isn't that interesting? Folks, ignoring truth is unprofitable. He writes in in verse 9 of chapter 3, he says, But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law. Now he's talking about the Jewish law there. Because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once. Do you know what the Greek word is for divisive person? Heretic. You know, people that are divisive, they like to argue all the time. That's a heretic, okay? Warn a divisive person once, and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such a man is warped and sinful. He's self-condemned. A Christian is to avoid unprofitable activities and unprofitable people. Isn't that something? So what's the profit of a godly life? That's a good question. What's the profit of a godly life? Well, good works result in a productive life. He said our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order that they may provide for daily necessities and not live an unproductive life. If you live this way, like Paul says, you'll be fruitful, productive for you, for the church, for the community, and people are attracted to what is genuine. You're doing it because it grows out of a heart of gratitude. So what's the standard for churches and for our lives? Well, when you minister, what do you emphasize? Do you mention, like Paul and Mary did, that you're, if people ask, you know, I'm doing this because I'm a Christian. I'm, Jesus did so much for me. I just want to do something to help you. Devotion or maintaining good work suggests a single-minded heart set on ministering to others in love. And that's what the Bible tells us. Love should be our motivation. God loves us, and because of that, we can pass his love on to others. Is that the result of what you believe? Is that illustrated in your life? I've said this before, one of my favorite quotes from Will Rogers. He said this with good Southern theology. He said, you can't teach what you don't know any more than you can come back from where you ain't been. I love that. (laughs) You can't teach what you don't know any more than you can come back from where you ain't been. You have to be doing it first before you're teaching it, right? We're not teaching when we aren't living. Many people think we are. But if we're not living it, we're not teaching it. So from this this short letter to Titus, Paul seems to be saying that the motto of the child of God is this. Ready to do whatever is good. That should be our motto. When people look at you, do they say that about you? That should be what they think of. They're, that person, they're ready to do whatever is good. Ready to do whatever is good. Nowhere else in all of his letters does Paul lay such a stress on the connection between truth and godly living. And as I mentioned, that's probably due to the pagan, ungodly culture in Crete, which is kind of reminiscent of America today. 
So let's review where we've been, what we've seen here. The great apostle has written to this young preacher that the truth of the gospel sets three standards for the lifestyle of the church. First, church leaders must be examples of what is good. And then, church members' lives must be good. And then third, everyone in the church must be devoted to doing what is good. Now, I always have to pause and say, now what we've seen today, what we've seen today applies to those who are followers of Jesus Christ through faith in him. But if someone's not a child of God, if you're not sure you are, you need to turn from your sinful self-centeredness and come to God through faith in Jesus Christ. And if you will say to God, Father, please accept me and adopt me, not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus Christ did in dying on the cross for my sin for me, if you'll do that, the Bible says you become a child of God at that very moment. So church, let's ask ourselves, do I love what is good? Do you love what is good? Does it show? Do I love to do what is good? Does it show? What kind of example am I to the church and to my family? How has the knowledge of the truth about Jesus Christ led you to live your life? It's always good to stop and think about that. Paul says that knowing the truth about Christ leads us to live a life of godliness different than the world around us and that we're eager to do we're eager to do what pleases God you remember Joe and Tom that I talked about at the beginning as your friends look at you do they see someone like Jesus or someone like the world around them? I'm not pointing any fingers I'm just asking you to think about out loud with me years ago I remember my mother reading a poem by Edgar Guest. It's called Actions Are Better Than Creeds. And I'd like to conclude with this. Listen to what he says. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one would walk with me than merely tell the way. The eye's a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but example is always clear. The best of all the preachers are the men that live their creeds. For to see good put in action is what everybody needs. I soon can learn to do it if you'll let me see it done. I can watch your hands in action, but your tongue too fast may run. The lectures you deliver may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get my lesson by observing what you do. I may not always understand the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. Folks, it's not what you say, but what we see that counts. What do people see when they look at you and me? Do they see Jesus living and working through you? I hope so. I hope so. Amen? Amen. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this, this short letter that Paul wrote to Titus. And the overarching lesson that we need to be eager to do what is good. Lord, I pray that that would be true of each one of us here today. That as people look at us, our families, our friends, our neighbors, that they would see Jesus Christ living through us, that his love would shine through as we serve them, minister to them, and love them in Jesus' name. Amen.